happens. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so we all know that art is therapeutic for the artist and for the viewer, but this is especially true when the subject is landscape. There's a huge body of recent literature on the beneficial effects of nature on human well-being. And I'm going to start by showing you, hopefully, yes, some books that I found useful a few years ago when I was preparing a lecture on the reasons why we enjoy landscape painting. So, top left, Edward O. Wilson, the entomologist who coined the term biophilia to express his view of the deep connection between humans and all other living things. Wilson is especially keen on biodiversity and conservation. His priority is the living creatures in the landscape, especially of course the insects, and his ideal landscape is the untouched wilderness. And then a book by two psychologists, Rachel and Stephen Kaplan, who've investigated the beneficial effects of nature on people's physical and mental health. Their concept of nature is in one sense all encompassing, including the tree at the end of the street, as well as the trapless forest, but in another sense quite narrow because they say very little about animals, birds, fish, insects, and so on. And their book is dedicated to the good earth and all things green and growing. Then top right, the journalist Richard Louvre, who emphasizes the importance of the experience of nature to children. He coined the term nature deficit disorder to express the fear that today's young children are growing up without playing outdoors and in the wild, and that this will have a bad effect on their mental and emotional health. This kind of concern has led many schools to take children out into the woods to learn directly from nature through forest schools. And then finally, a recent collection of essays, Landscape, Wellbeing and Environment, which brought together these ideas under the heading of well-being. And I found these essays useful because they come from all sorts of different backgrounds, healthcare, geography, forestry, museums, social sciences, architecture and planning. The Kaplans emphasise the wide range of ways that nature can be beneficial. Um, it could be just a pot plant on a windowsill, so one can be absorbed by the blossoms of an African violet on the windowsill, or cascading waterfalls, or the rustle of wind in the trees. Nature, they found, um, is something that comforts and restores. It provides a sense of wholesomeness and repose. And, and all these studies are claiming that what they found out about the effect of nature and well-being applies across all cult cultures and times and places. Um, it's, it's something that's um, innate to humanity, to um, our, our um, character as, as human beings. I organised a conference at Oxford Brooks on trees and well-being in 2018. And one of the speakers, Dan Bloomfield, had been involved in a study entitled A Dose of Nature at the University of Exeter. And I was just looking this up the other day and I see there's now a charity of this name which has a website and was established coincidentally in 2018, though I wasn't aware of it at the time. Studies from all over the world indicate that green prescriptions are effective and there's loads and loads of stuff like this on the internet if you want to research this further. I must apologize to, to some of you who know all this already, but I thought this would be a useful introduction. And then here are some books that I haven't read yet, but I probably should. Um, Ecotherapy, um, which I guess speaks for itself. Um, Shinrin Yoku, The Art of Forest Bathing, which be has become very fashionable recently. And then Richard Maybe's book, which I only know from reading reviews, but which I gather is about of his own use of nature to cure his depression. So all of this amounts to overwhelming and recent evidence that humans are happier and healthier mentally, emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically, when they're in touch with nature. And I think that's really been confirmed by the um, recent lockdown that lots of people have said how they, they really find comfort from getting out walking and watching the wildflowers growing and so on. So what kinds of contact with nature are most therapeutic? Is it going into the wilderness, as some people would say, or is it just noticing things like um, the flowering of cherry blossom, as the National Trust is now recommending we should do. The imagery of trees features a lot in these book covers and also on the website that I showed you. Empirical research has shown that patients and prisoners, for example, do better if they can see trees from their wards or cells. And there's a lot in the literature about walking in the woods and how that can enhance mental health. Meanwhile, other studies have shown that the heart rate slows and blood pressure drops when people look at large bodies of water, such as lakes or the sea. Pictures of these natural environments, as well as the environments themselves, have been shown to enhance well-being. 
Experiments of this kind generally use photographs, but obviously the findings would apply to paintings too. And of course, with landscape paintings, you get a little bit more than you get from just looking at a photograph. Um, in the literature, these findings are often represented as new and scientific, and a lot of the phraseology is new as well. Terms like biophilia, nature deficit, ecotherapy, dose of nature, green prescription, forest bathing, etc. But actually, artists and writers have had these insights in the past, especially those of the Romantic generation. So, for example, Brooke Boothby is clearly indulging here in a bit of forest bathing. Um, when I first heard about forest bathing, I thought you had to lie down to do it, but I, I, I think I understand now that you don't. But, but um, he's, he's immersing himself in the woods. Brooke Boothby is on his own, but many paintings in the middle decades of the 19th century emphasise the social pleasures of being out in the woods. Happy couples and families populate the leafy glades in pa paintings by Bristol School artists, often set in Lee Woods on the edge of the city. And the literature of the mid 19th century emphasizes the pleasures of shady woods in the summertime, especially in June. For example, here are some reviews of work by Richard Redgrave. In 1849, an anonymous critic wrote, Redgrave goes into the wood, he sees the branches interlaced over him. The leaves dapple the vault of shade and ring the changes on sunny light and sombre dark. His heart is filled with pleasure and love. And in 1851, William Makepeace Thackeray describes one of Redgrave's works as a quiet little piece of checkered shade and sunshine, suggestive of repose and peaceful meditation. Paintings like this one too, suggest the happy coexistence of animals and humans. Um, and of course, being in the landscape isn't just about what you see, it's about all your senses, it's about what you hear as well. Um, in this watercolour by George Price Boyce, you've got a mother and child in the bottom right hand corner sitting under an apple tree, you can see the apples on the tree, um, but you've also got lots of birds. So when you look at this landscape, you don't just imagine seeing that scene, you can imagine what you could hear. So you've got guinea fowls pecking at the grass here, a dove cot, more trees on, uh, sorry, more birds on the roof lines here and little birds up in the willow tree um, and further birds um, at a bird bath over here. There are lots of paintings of Burnham beaches in the 1860s and 1870s. This is one of my favourites. It was an area that was under threat from housing development at the time and it was eventually bought by the City of London Corporation in 1880 so that it could remain open for public recreation. Uh, the very word recreation has something to do with well-being too, doesn't it? Um, in 1883, Francis George Heath, who'd led the campaign to preserve it, um, wrote a book, Burnham Beaches, and he argues that artists had helped to ensure that it had been well, that it would be preserved by um, showing us paintings of how beautiful it was. His description of the delights of beech woods emphasizes their effect on well-being. And he wrote, from the burning heat of the midday glade, it is delicious to plunge into the greenwood, and few forest trees offer such complete and refreshing shade as the beach. How refreshing it is to look up into the heaven of leafiness above. How soothing to listen to the music of the leaves as they make merry in the sunshine. So here you have language that is similar to what you get in the literature today. The Kaplan say that nature comforts and restores. Heath says that beech woods refresh and soothe. And these are all terms that, that relate to mental well-being. The very act of painting and drawing landscapes also contributes to an artist's mental health. John Constable, for example, never experienced wilderness and I doubt that he would have enjoyed it. According to his biographer, Charles Robert Leslie, he even found the solitudes of the Lake District depressing. And although many recent art historians have described the farmed landscape around his home as man-made or even as being like an open air factory, he definitely felt that it was nature. When he wrote about it, he described it as nature. Stephen and Rachel Kaplan found that even a pot plant on a windowsill could supply some of the effects on well-being that came from contact with nature. So obviously a landscape like this would do much, much more. In his final lecture on landscape painting, Constable declared, I will be greatly mistaken if every landscape painter will not acknowledge that his most serene hours have been spent in the open air with his palette in his hand. And this picture was started in the open air or even though it was finished in the studio. And he wrote to his wife, Maria, um, well, his to-be wife, Maria, on October the 18th, 1815. I cannot help regretting the departure of our delightful summer, but I continue to work as much as possible in the fields, 
as my mind is never so calm and comfortable as at those times. Painting out of doors, which was becoming increasingly popular in the 19th century, gave artists therefore the benefits of being in nature as well as representing it. And the words that Constable's using, serene, calm, comfortable, all suggest mental and emotional well-being. Constable also did a lot of painting on the coast in Brighton, where he took his wife repeatedly in the hope that the sea air would ease her consumption. In the 19th century, people went to the coast to cure mental as well as physical ills. Experiencing sea breezes and drinking seawater and bathing were all regarded as good for reviving what they then called the animal spirits, um, which meant, amongst other things, helping to cure depression. Constable seascapes show brisk winds with sailing boats being blown about. Um, not necessarily our idea now of, of a nice day at the sea where we expect sunshine and blue sky. But this was the kind of weather that would help consumptives and would also lift the spirits of depressives. So it was good for both physical and mental well-being. He used his Brighton studies to paint pictures of other coastal locations, sometimes cheating a bit by, for example, using the same sky and two different, completely different pictures. Um, there are two recorded instances of the buyers of these landscapes experiencing an effect on their well-being. A Mr Pullum, for example, thanked Constable for a picture of Harwich Lighthouse, like this one, and wrote, I think I feel myself benefited by the sea air. And a similar example is um, a picture of Yarmouth Jetty. Constable gave a picture, there, there are several pictures of, of, of these subjects, one of these was given to his doctor, Dr. Gooch, in gratitude for his care of Maria. And he wrote to a friend that um, Dr. Gooch apparently used to put it on the sofa while he breakfasted, as he used to say, on the seashore, enjoying its breezes. So clear evidence here. I mean, it seems obvious in a way that people would look at the, the paintings and get the same sort of benefits that they might from actually getting being in the place. Um, and here clearly it's effect on mental well-being rather than physical. Or is it? I mean, they're so closely interlinked, who knows? This painting dates from the, his last visit to Brighton, just before his wife died, and its stormy subject and rough palette knife technique have been linked to Constable's emotional turmoil at this time. So all in all, the sea had a range of therapeutic benefits for Constable, soothing his mental and emotional health just as the breezes soothed his wife's physical condition. And finally, I would say that studying landscape painting also contributes to well-being. Um, looking at the paintings, reading about them, making practical visits to coastal locations or to look at trees or to or study particular trees, um, just walking on the coast and walking in the woods. Um, I can say, you know, as a result of my empirical study, I found it's all been very good for my mental health. So there are threefold benefits. Um, that link landscape and well-being for the artist making the paintings, for the viewers of these paintings and drawings, and then finally for the art historian who makes landscape painting their area of study. Okay, so thank you very much. That's it.